Madeleine Vianney is a legend. She was an icon with a legacy lasting even to this day, not only in design, but in her amazing work for intellectual copywriting and for workers' rights. However, despite her incredible impact on fashion, her original house only lasted 27 years. So why was that? And why have the few attempts at reviving the label been so unnoticed? Technically, the House of Viennet was opened in 1912, but Madeleine Viennet had been a couturier for many years. She worked for a lace maker when she was 12 in 1888, before moving to London to work for Kate Riley, a London-based couturier, in 1897. From around this time onwards, Viennet began working along with clients directly and understanding their wants and needs, something that would continue through her move to the Calosseur Couture House in Paris, where she would truly study the art of couture dressmaking under the three Calot sisters before being poached in 1907 by Jacques Doucet, a massive couturier at the time, to add a youthful flavour to his couture house. It was here at Jacques Doucet that she would really make a name for herself by removing the corset, which up until this point was a necessary undergarment for women. Removing the corset was still a surprising evolution in fashion for the everywoman, but it had been brewing for a while in the arts via people like Gustave Klimt, who painted Emilie Floge, who famously did not wear corsets, and in Viennese inspiration, Isadora Duncan, who danced in these sheet-like dresses. Even in fashion, in the same year as Viennese, Fortuny showed the sans-corseted Delphos dress in 1907. So though we don't technically know who began removing corsets, Viennese was right at the forefront of this movement, which is how she began to make a name for herself in the couture scene as a couturier with a modern approach to dressmaking. She was so well loved, in fact, that she was able to open her aforementioned studio in 1912 with financing from May Liliaz. The reference from this I actually learned from a journal article that I cannot show you yet because of spoilers, but they reference this book by Pamela Goldbin as their source. There are very few images of her creations from this time, but from what we do have, we know that her designs were very raw at this stage. She was already draping on a reduced scale mannequin in order to invent new silhouettes and shapes that simply hadn't been explored before, and it was this draping technique that she would become famous for. But she hadn't actually developed the style that she would become synonymous with just yet, and she may never have if her work wasn't interrupted. In 1914, the First World War began. The shop was closed and Madeleine Viennet spent the war in Rome, where she began to experiment with fabrics more and more, honing her craft. It's during this time that she invented what would come to be known as the bias cut dress. The bias is the diagonal of a piece of fabric, and because of the structure of the weave working almost like scissors when held on the diagonal, it has a natural stretch to it. Viennet commissioned extra wide runs of fabric to be made so that she could adjust the pattern pieces of her dresses to be cut on the bias instead of on the straight grain, thus allowing a stretchiness that would lend to a totally different, more comfortable, more figure-hugging drape. It was extremely innovative for the time. This was the land before elastane, so nothing like this had truly been experienced in their modern day. But yet, no one had seen it and they wouldn't until 1919 when Viennet would return to Paris, this time with financing by Emile Accard, joining May Liliaz and managing directors Louis Angel and Armand Truyer, who ran the business side on her behalf as was common for female couturiers at the time, as this was about 40 years before women could even own their own bank accounts in France. Viennet returned in 1919 to massive success, but she was still the in designer to know, her style was still far surpassed by designers like Chanel, Doucette and Fortuny, who had seen worldwide acclaim, while Viennet's success was purposefully more low-key. Despite her aversion to fame, she became known for being a true innovator within the scene. This combination of a unique vision and a unique method made her incredibly respected amongst other designers who would take inspiration from her and try to stock her designs within their own couture houses. This would have been standard practice at the time too, because going to Paris for haute couture was extremely costly, both in time and in money, especially for the client to remain in Paris for however many fittings it took for the house to actually make your design. 
So having something closer to home made sense even for the wealthiest of clients. Thereby, this became a common part of the couture business structure amongst the top couturiers, who would use the sales of their patterns to other less famous couturiers or seamstresses or even to department stores to fund their own, much larger couture houses, in a similar way to how perfume sales can fund couture today. However, v hated this practice and adamantly did not share her designs with any other company, fellow couturier or otherwise, despite how in demand she was for the international in the no client. She made it a point to make all her clients come to her in Paris if they wanted her designs, something few couturiers could afford to implement. But this left VNA extremely susceptible to counterfeit garments, without having any way to profit from the system. One might think that the easy remedy would just be to acquiesce to selling her patterns, but instead of caving into this industry standard, she innovated. Vianney began producing her designs with a label that included the garment's collection number, her personal signature, and her fingerprint. She would even reward anyone who brought her attention to fakes of her work being sold with no less than 1,000 francs. She created a business set up to help protect her intellectual property with Louis d'Angèle, and she also registered every single creation with the Register of Design and Models in Paris in an effort to copyright her work. All of this was groundbreaking at the time and is still the foundation for fashion copywriting today. This was all then advertised to the public, promoting her couture house as the only place in the world to get a V&A original. Anything else was fake and she would sue them if they were to reproduce her works, which she actually did enact, this was not just a threat. She clearly felt extremely passionately about her intellectual property rights and was willing to spend time, money, and energy on protecting them. She didn't necessarily seem to mind if she wasn't making as much money or getting as much fame as some of her other peers, but she did mind if her work was being bastardized. However, her business partners were less enthusiastic about actively making less money, and she was quickly forced to compromise. In 1921, she opened a label called Eva Boex to whom she would license her own replicas, somewhat similar to how we would think of as a diffusion line now, but was really more akin to a couture version of Ready to Wear. They made simplified versions of the original designs, and the quality was noticeably lesser, but were still made mostly by hand, as was the norm in those days. Also, the brand was actually not known to be v at the time, and to the public, this actually just seemed more like an official licensee. But this expansion into licensing didn't stop there. In June 1922, Theophile Bader, co-founder of Galerie Lafayette, contributed 200,000 francs to the business in exchange for 20% of the company. He joined Emile Lacar and Liliaz, all with 20%, leaving v herself with 40%. By only the following year, Edouard Martinez de la Rose replaced Akar, and Viennet covertly began selling their designs to a very select group of couturiers, including Balenciaga starting in 1924, who in this pre-new look days had not seen worldwide acclaim and was still a small in the no couturier in Spain. So, Viennet now had a diffusion line and sold her patterns to select couturiers but her business partners still had bigger plans. In 1925, V&A became the first couture house to open a subsidiary in New York that sold pre-made designs that were left unfinished so could be altered to fit clients. In the same year, they also began producing ready-to-wear designs for US wholesale, making V&A the owner of the first Pret-a-Porter line ever from an oak couture house. And still in 1925, V&A became one of the first couturiers with a fragrance launching four named A, B, C, and D in a licensing deal with Coty. And so began the financial glory years of v They were now financially very successful, and her fame was ever-growing in the scene. She began innovating with design, using her signature bias cut, and even potentially had the first zipper used in Couture in 1929, six years before Scaparelli used them. 
By 1932, V&A opened a five-story building on 50 Avenue Montaigne that employed 1,200 seamstresses, plus doctors, dentists, and they even had a gym. Her employees had incredible health care, with the on-site doctors and dentists, as well as paid holiday time and paid maternity leave. She truly cared about her team just as much as she cared about the copyright laws of her own designs. And the employee rights that she championed were literally the best in the industry, even better than many modern day companies. Through the 30s, she was one of the most important designers, not only in Paris, but in the world, regularly releasing hit collection after hit collection. She became famed for her draping style, not often using fastenings, and her very comfortable yet fashionable clothing. Even her fitting method became famed. She would purposely have clients move around in the studio in order to make sure that her designs were extremely comfortably draped for each individual. The designs were photographed extensively from the best photographers of the day, and she was seemingly on an endlessly upwards path. At least, that was until the company would come to a surprise halt. Despite reconstructing considerations, on the 2nd of August 1939, the company was shut down as the Second World War loomed. And only the following year, v herself retired from the industry entirely. She never reopened her house, and actually very little is online about what she did during the war at all. I tried to get my hands on the books about her, but they were just too expensive because they're out of print. I also contacted both the brand themselves via Instagram and the author of their premier book, respected historian Pamela Golbin. I even went as far as contacting the Musée des Arts Décoratifs, which holds the largest library of information on V&A and yet still came up fruitless. I even attempted chat GPT, but then I couldn't verify the information that it gave me. I genuinely don't know what she did during the war, and I cannot guarantee why she never came back to design. But personally, I think that she was just simply too old and didn't want to return. She was born in 1876, so she would have been 79 when the war ended in 1945, so that's simply my main theory. But in theory, they could have just reopened the business with a new head designer and a different business team, and yet that also didn't happen. Not even after her death in 1975 at 99 years old. So it's a bit of a mystery as to what happened in this period of the brand. All that we do know is that the brand pretty much just lay dormant until 1988 when the brand was sold to the Luhmann family who used their personal funds to bring back the company. They continued to lay low through the early 90s though as the company sorted out its logistics and rebranded Madeleine Viennet the person to the public as this lost genius after they announced an upcoming relaunch for the brand in 1994. They then began producing perfumes and accessories under the Viennet name, with the perfumes in contract with Daniel Aubusson, and the accessories beginning with scarves before expanding to other pieces, including men's accessories. v the company at this time, would have been called a Sleeping Beauty, which effectively is a brand with huge value, but that the public don't know a lot about. So they can use that asset of having a remembered brand name and brand history while cherry picking which parts of the history to reintroduce the public to. Notably for VNA, this meant the Egyptian and Art Deco inspiration was unmentioned in place of more of an emphasis on her Greek influence. Madeleine VNA wasn't famous towards the masses. She had shunned the limelight during her life, and that subsequently meant that her legacy just wasn't as well known by the general public. But because she had been so incredibly innovative and influential, she was still revered by historians, designers, and people with a deeper interest in fashion. Despite a few naysayers, the name had value, and the people that knew it were eagerly awaiting this revival of the brand under the Luhmann family. But in fact, the public would be waiting a long time, as the revival would only arrive after the brand was taken over by Guy de Luman's son, Arnaud de Luman, who re-debuted v in December 2006 with this, the Spring-Summer 07 collection. 
that were sold in extremely limited quantities in an exclusivity contract with Barneys, who financed both this, the Spring Summer 07, and the Autumn Winter 07 collections. The designer brought on for the Ready to Wear collections was called Sofia Kokosalaki, who was of Greek descent, something that today one may find respectful of a brand that does have such obvious and heavy inspiration from Greek historical culture. But, despite having good reviews, sales equating to half a million euros in 2006 and tripling that in 2007, an interesting PR strategy involving Vogue doing a four-page spread on the revival and having Barney's host an event, Coco Salaki left after Renzo Rosso agreed to finance her namesake label. She was replaced in May 2007 by Mark Ortibet as artistic advisor, who produced Spring Summer 08 only before handing in his notice after they refused him an enormous raise. Neither of these designers in their combined three collections made a bad collection. They were objectively very respectful of the house's original codes and in general both made very commercial and interesting collections. They just failed to hit the wider zeitgeist and neither managed to turn the company profitable by the goal of 2008. So, b took a different approach. They began promoting that they were working with a team of designers equally, not just one head designer, stating that they wanted the focus to be on the brand, not on the fame of one person. It's an interesting concept, but technically it wasn't true. The Autumn Winter 08 collection was designed by Gitam Mays, who had been with the company since 2006. It's just that he wasn't widely publicized to have designed it. This was to avoid the obviously predictably bad press that comes with musical chairs at the top, which would scare off investors who they were very much in need of, especially after Audi Bet went to the press to accuse them of being incompetent business people after he quit. But fortunately, they were still in the thoughts of investor Matteo Marzotto, who was taken on board in 2008 and eventually bought the whole business along with Gianni Castiglioni of the Marni Castiglionis. The new pair of owners first named Rodolfo Paglialunga as creative director in 2009, then replaced him with twins Barbara and Lucia Cross as co-creative directors in 2011 with their debut as this Autumn Winter 2012 collection. So v continued to have their ongoing shakeup that started in 2006, which often looks very unstable in fashion business. But despite this, v was beginning to see some growth. They finally turned a profit of €116,000 in 2008 and made their first million in profit in 2009. They even opened their first store, owned solely by the company in 2011 in Milan, after which they finally had some buzz in a new era of fashion, which meant that they were primed for a buyout. In 2012, a majority stake and then control of the company was purchased by Goga Ashkenazi. To continue with the brand's revolving door creative directorship, she named herself as creative director, though it was actually the in-house team that replaced Barbara and Lucia Krosh after they cut their contract short following a falling out with Ashkenazi meaning that the twins only actually stayed for one collection. But then, two years after this, Ashkenazi replaced herself for the Demi Couture with the formidable Hussein Chalayan, who debuted in spring 2014. The Demi Couture had actually started in 2012 as a non-commercial project to celebrate 100 years of business, but unfortunately was far overshadowed by the ridiculously turbulent leadership. So it was a huge deal to get a big name like Hussein Chalayan who was an extremely respected designer already by this point. Most famed for this collection of wearable furniture, Chalayan became their most successful head designer by far. His take on the bias cut and the original codes of the house of draping were exquisite and clearly extremely popular as by the following year they opened a Paris store and began to show ready to wear together, debuting in spring summer 16, after Goga, who was supposedly designing the ready to wear since her takeover, hadn't been getting the best reception in comparison. The Chalayan ready to wear is also phenomenal, a great transposition of what he was bringing to Couture and markedly different to what he was doing at his relaunched namesake label, which just shows his talent as a designer so truly. 
He was also joined with a new emphasis on sustainability and philanthropy for the label, which saw them in 2018 release a collaboration collection with Mark Quinn that donated 50% of the profits to charity Parlay for the Oceans. This was the longest and most profitable era of v since the interwar period. And they could have continued on this steady upwards trajectory very easily. But they didn't. In October 2018, the decision was taken to voluntarily liquidate the entire company in order to relaunch as a sustainable brand. They've been championing sustainability for a long time, and they were willing to put their money where their mouth is to take this incredible leap of faith. Evidently, when they released the Mark Quinn Collaborative Collection, it was a test to see how much v needed to change in order for them to truly support sustainability. And it turned out that it was just the entire logistics of the company. However, that turned out not really to be the truth, as in April 2023, v was sold to Chimera, Abu Dhabi and Hair Capital, who signed a joint venture setting up Chim Hair's investment holding as the parent company for v Neither company have a history in fashion, or so it seems from a quick Google search, but they have bought several together since the setting up of Chim Hairs, though v is the most famous name. Unfortunately, I don't have high hopes for v under their leadership because of this. Luxury fashion is a tricky business, it doesn't turn a profit very easily, and so when the uninitiated start buying fashion companies, they do often turn into vessels for low quality high margin items like shoes and bags when they don't see a return on investment immediately or as immediately as they think that they should. These products are often without the best design and then that in turn really affects the brand value over time. The VNA name still does have value so it is unfortunately really vulnerable to this kind of bastardization so I just genuinely hope it doesn't go this way when and if they do eventually re relaunch the brand. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. Check out my beauty channel for more videos like this but about beauty brands and subscribe to my Patreon for early access.